welcome to the Sleep On It podcast, brought to you by Aeroflow Sleep. I'm your host, Megan, and today I'm joined by Emma Cooksey. Emma has a complicated history with sleep apnea. At the age of 30, after more than a decade of unexplained health problems, she was diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea. She felt alone and isolated, navigating life with her sleep disorder and adjusting to pap therapy without much guidance. Now she's Aeroflow Sleep's patient advocacy expert, a director of the board at Project Sleep, and the host of her own podcast, Sleep Apnea Stories. Emma really loves raising awareness about sleep apnea and its treatment options, and together we'll explore the ins and outs of what you yourself may be experiencing. So thanks for listening, and let's begin. Heads, it's Megan with Aeroflow Sleep. I'm joined today by Emma Cooksey, and this is our very first Sleep on It podcast. <laughs> thank you for having me, Megan. I'm so excited to be here. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Emma has her own podcast, and she is a real life sleep apnea patient. So, of course, it was you know obvious that we should have her on. Uh, for our very first one. So, uh, Emma, obviously you've had a lot of experience uh, with sleep apnea because this is all about what is sleep apnea. Well, this is definitely my favorite subject and thank you so much for having me. So there are, we normally talk about sleep apnea as being three different kinds. There's obstructive, there's central, and there's mixed. So with obstructive sleep apnea which is the most common that's what I have and um, something is happening in your upper airway where it's either getting blocked or collapsing and no air is getting to your um, brain during these episodes that happen multiple multiple times all night so it's kind of like a cycle where your airway closes either sometimes people's tongue and soft tissue falls back in their throat and blocks it. Sometimes people have pretty small airways and they kind of get stuck together like a wet straw. (laughs) And, but whatever that blockage or obstruction is, it just cuts off the air to your brain and your brain sends messages to your body saying we need to breathe. And that wakes you up usually with a gasp and, um, stops the the we call it like an apnea the the event where you stop breathing um but obviously that person is not getting good quality sleep because it happens multiple multiple times all night and um it's a really stressful way to sleep so that's kind of obstructive sleep apnea in a nutshell and then central sleep apnea is slightly different because it's to do with your brain not sending the message to your body to breathe Um, And then mixed sleep apnea is a combination of those two things together. Um, So, yeah. So I hope that that explains it kind of really basic. No, you did a great job. (laughs) I'm I'm shocked at the level of detail that uh, you understand it and and having a little medical background other than, you know, just being a sleep apnea patient and living with this every day. Yeah, I mean, like, I've spent three and a half years just interviewing people on my weekly podcast. um, And a lot of those people have been doctors and dentists and all sorts of specialists. So I feel like if you spend enough time (laughs) just nerding out on one thing, you just kind of become kind of an expert in it, I guess. Oh, I I completely agree and completely understand because, I mean, that's that's basically what I do every day as well. Yeah. Um, Obviously, uh, Emma and myself, we are not uh, medical providers. We are right. not licensed medical professionals. Um, so anything that we do say today, you know, take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, this is not a substitute for going and speaking with your doctor. Um, but this is just knowledge and experience that we have acquired um, through the years. Um, Emma, certainly having more experience than myself, actually having sleep apnea, uh, what's that like? Wow, what's it like having sleep apnea? Well, I think that there's a really big difference between having undiagnosed sleep apnea and not knowing what the heck it is that's going on with your health um, versus having treated sleep apnea. So I have a lot of experience with both. I went undiagnosed for 10 years. So when I was undiagnosed, I I really had 
a lot of daytime sleepiness, which was to the point that it impacted my life. It was tough for me to make it through the afternoon at work. And, um, you know, like when I say daytime sleepiness, I'm talking about having a really tough time staying awake. So I think sometimes people get confused because they think, well, they feel fatigued, like their body's really tired. But what I'm talking about is the kind of um, struggling to keep your eyes open, you know, drowsy driving, that kind of thing. I, I definitely, uh, I think that it's important to stress that difference as you just did, that yeah. it's not like, oh, I need to take a nap every now and then on the couch. Now, napping certainly can be uh, a, a coping strategy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> It's not, I didn't have coffee this morning. It is a very different kind of sleepiness where you cannot, uh, you know, stay awake uh, yeah. to the point of drowsy driving. Which and, is and like we said before, like everybody has a different experience of this, but I think that from all the people that I've interviewed, some sort of daytime sleepiness is a really good indicator that it'd be a good time to go and see your doctor and ask questions about your sleep. Because I think that, you know, there are so many different sleep disorders, some, you know, a lot rarer than sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is pretty common. Um, but the one thing that we all seem to have in common is this daytime sleepiness element. Um, so yeah, if that's happening to you, then definitely go and see your doctor. But generally, I would say my life's much improved now that I got a diagnosis and treatment. And it also just feels great to have answers to a lot of the unanswered health questions I had you know like all these different symptoms I was going to the doctor with um whether it was like morning headaches or um just even cognitive like word finding and mm -hmm. just trying to hold a thought in your head <laughs> it's a wow. lot more difficult if you don't have you know the the sleep and the oxygen to your brain that you need so yeah and you were fortunate enough at least to you know have a bed partner you have your husband um, so when you were waking up and gasping for air, you had that validation um, to say, yeah, no, something is wrong because. He I mean, did I? <laughs> like, <laughs> my, my husband's not very observant. So I feel like a lot of his observations came extremely like late in the game. You know, I came home and I was telling him about this thing, sleep apnea. And he was saying, oh, you, yeah, you do snore and you do wake up gasping. But that wasn't a thing that was factoring in before. So he wasn't telling you, you were telling him. No. And he was like, yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah, I suppose, that, I suppose that is a thing. Okay, so then how did you find out that you have sleep apnea? Yeah, so when, so I should probably just say really briefly for anybody confused, I grew up in Scotland and then I met my husband there and we moved to Florida in 2007. And then um, immediately after that, I got pregnant with our first child, Katie. Aww. And I actually had this experience where when I had a newborn, I was tired, but I didn't really feel that much more tired than I was normally feeling with undiagnosed sleep apnea. So shortly, like she just was this really easy baby that slept through the night really early on. Um, and I had this opportunity to sleep for six or seven hours, uh, you know, a stretch, which I think is pretty <laughs> unusual with a small baby. Um, but I really didn't feel better. I, I still felt terrible. And I'd been feeling that way pretty much for 10 years. And I finally went to the doctor and I explained like all of my different symptoms. And she said, like, you know, you're quite a young woman and you don't have a lot of risk factors for sleep apnea so I'm not sure that we would test for that well mm -hmm. then three weeks after that I was with my baby driving back over a bridge and I had that really intense uh, drowsy feeling that I was going to fall asleep and yeah. I did fall asleep at the wheel for like that split second and it was like there was a huge truck quite far away from me and then it suddenly was coming towards me and I had to slam my brakes not to hit the truck oh my gosh yeah so um that was really like the I guess wake up call right that ah. there's something really wrong so I was really shaken by that and I went home I gave the baby to my husband and I said I need to call that doctor back 
Um, and I called the doctor's office and I said, I know that you said I didn't have a lot of risk factors for testing my sleep, but I fell asleep at the wheel. And even though I'd felt drowsy before in the car, I'd never full on fallen asleep and I'd never had my baby in the car with me. Yeah. So I think that that was like just a level where I just found it almost was like the impetus for me really to push and advocate for some testing and some answers. That's a crazy story. That's a crazy way to figure out that you have sleep apnea uh, to fall asleep at the wheel like that and and I think sometimes people look at what I do now and they I mean I don't know I, a lot of uh, suburban mothers don't start podcasts in their closet right about sleep apnea. <laughs> but I think that all of my advocacy and everything I do kind of stems from um that incident and yeah. just feeling like um so many people are undiagnosed we think it's about 80 percent mm -hmm. of people with sleep apnea don't have a diagnosis and that number is just way too high and these are really life and death you know issues I think that the statistic the last that I saw it was a million people in the U.S. have it and 80 percent don't know it yeah. Um, which is that's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. I mean, yeah. it is very easy to have sleep apnea and not know it um, because of all of the symptoms that, you know, we could attribute to just yeah. napping. I always think that a part of it is um, just that our culture is just a whole bunch of really tired people. <laughs> and we normalize, like, we normalize that everybody's exhausted everybody's yeah. doing too much right no it's Especially, true we normalize yeah. anxiety we normalize like all of these things that should not be the way that they are and plus you mentioned earlier and I think it's very important uh is that you know you went to your doctor and at first she didn't want to test you because you're a young healthy woman and there is a sleep apnea stereotype people assume that that the only people that have sleep apnea are older men in uh in you know an, an overweight state mm -hmm. uh and that's certainly not the case women can have it athletes can have it so very very fit people very young people um my best friend from high school has it and she's younger than me she's in her 20s that's really um, young yeah, I, I mean, it could, it can literally happen to anyone, but until yeah. we break that stigma, I don't think people are going to, you know. Yeah, go and agreed. So I think the more that we can think about um, symptoms, obviously doctors have to do screeners, you know, not everybody is going to qualify to get tested, but I think the more testing, the better. And if we can focus on people's, especially daytime sleepiness and big symptoms like that, they need to be addressed for people. Yeah. So what you should do if you think you have sleep apnea, um, obviously we've covered, talk to your doctor, um, get tested. Um, now there are two different ways that you can get tested. You can test in the home. Uh, it's a great option where you just have a little sensor that attaches to your finger and it will read your blood oxygen levels as well as your breathing patterns um, based on those blood oxygen levels. Uh, as well as uh, in the lab. Um, which one did you do? Were you a home sleep test? Or... <laughs> I love this question because <laughs> I go to conferences all the time now with sleep techs and they go, what? <laughs> I had a kind of hybrid that they were trying out. My insurance company was testing this to see if it was going to be, you know, like cost effective, but also, you know, like still achieve the results that they were looking for so they sent a sleep tech to my house who hooked me up to all of the wires and explained how everything worked set up a laptop beside my bed with a webcam pointed at me so that a sleep tech in texas could watch me sleep stop it yeah so and it and it worked pretty well like you know they were able to do the polysomnogram it just is quite an odd like you know I haven't heard of that since so I'm not sure mm -hmm. that, that yeah everybody I tell about it they're like which insurance company what was it <laughs> yeah never never um, heard of that before yeah. typically today they're 
those two options, the home sleep test or the in lab. Um, obviously, Aeroflow Sleep, we are a DME company, um, so we provide you with CPAP supplies through insurance after the fact. So there is an important note there where most insurance companies uh, do not accept a home sleep test. Uh, they don't feel that it is as accurate as in lab. Mm. That is changing though every day. It's gotten so much better than mm -hmm. it did before. Um, so definitely look into the home sleep test if you're more comfortable. And certainly um, further down the road, like, um, you know, most people listening maybe are, are at the first stage where they haven't got a diagnosis, but for people yeah. later on, if you're looking to replace your CPAP machine, I certainly found, because usually every five years, you'll you'll get a replacement CPAP machine. Yeah. And I've certainly found the last two times I did that, the home sleep study was fine for that. They kind of just are confirming what's already been shown before. So mm -hmm. my certainly my insurance company was was okay with that. That's great. And that's a great segue uh, because what your treatment option is after you get diagnosed with sleep apnea, if you get diagnosed with sleep apnea, mm -hmm. uh, the golden standard is your CPAP machine, which looks like... Do you have one there, Megan? Of course I do. So organized. I love it. <laughs> this is the Resvent iBreeze uh, auto CPAP machine, which technically means that it's an APAP machine. Mm -hmm. But this is what it typically looks like. Um, most of them are going to have your little knob for your settings, powers on the top. You plug in a tube in the back. Uh, your water chamber is here off to the side. And how a CPAP works is it's basically blowing air through the machine so that it is pressurized and keeps your airways open. Um, and you do have the humidifier so that the air stays moist because um, it's very important that uh, you don't have dry air going in. Uh, otherwise, you're going to wake up with dry mouth and headaches and all of the side effects you're trying to avoid in the first place. <laughs> and then you would hook your CPAP mask up to the tube. Uh, so imagine there's a long tube. Of course, the only part that I don't have readily available is, well, it's in my closet. I could get it. <laughs> Your closet sounds like my closet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you put the tube uh, here. Most of the times it's connected at the front, but this happens to be a top of head tubing uh, uh, mask and it would run from here off to your CPAP machine and that's where all the air comes through into this lovely little mask here. So it's worth saying that um, masks and mask fit are huge. So I think that at Aeroflow you help people with that but I know that that's something that people really can struggle with if they're left to their own devices. When I first started CPAP I think that of course, this was a long time ago. Things have really improved a lot. Yeah. Um, so I would say that there were less mass choices. Um, and also, I didn't really have the the basic education of this mass fits well and this one doesn't. So I was struggling in the first few weeks, like with masks that just really didn't fit my face, were not the right size. Like they come in different size makes models. And you often need to try a few before you find the one that works for you. Yeah, uh, Airflow Sleep does help with that. You're absolutely right. Uh, we have a mask fitting technology that's pretty revolutionary uh, even today. It's only been out a couple of years now. Um, and what it does is that you can take a selfie of your face. So you're just taking a photo um, of your face and it analyzes each of the contours your unique skull shape um, and spits out information as far as your size, the make and model of the you know mask that would be best suited for you. Of course, there are questions that we ask you, of course, that you would like uh, a, a full face or a nasal or a nasal pillow to get started um, because that does matter. And sometimes your doctor will go ahead and prescribe uh, a full face if you, um, need uh if you're a mouth breather so you open your mouth uh during the night and you, it's going to just be a natural habit uh you want to make sure that you're breathing in the air so it would cover your 
your mm -hmm. mouth entirely, or you could be claustrophobic and not want so much coverage. Uh, so you just want a little nasal insert. I think, I think the whole mouth breathing, nasal breathing is something that like we often gloss over, but it makes such a huge difference with, um, with masks. Um, I think especially, uh, you know, I come across people every so often where they'll be using a nasal mask or a nasal pillows mask, but then their mouth is falling open. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's worth people just knowing like the, the pressurized air has to go into your upper airway to keep it open. Yeah. So if it's going out of your mouth, that's going to mess with the the pressure yes so, yeah there's a lot to consider with masks yeah you're completely losing the point of having pressurized air in the first place uh so definitely look for a full face mask in that case or a chin strap like if you really have to have just the nasal there is a piece of uh material that you can close off your mouth um and keep your jaw uh from opening during the night um that's less likely to work for some people. Um, and that is considered an accessory or a luxury. So again, another piece that insurance may not cover, but insurance does typically cover that machine, your mask, the different parts like tubing that are required, and it uh, will cover the replacements. And it's really important that people replace all the replaceable parts. So that's that's to um, make sure that the it's not just because it's nice to do, it's to make sure that the machine carries on functioning as it should. We really want to make sure that the longevity of your parts lasts. It is first and foremost healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to clean and maintain uh, your CPAP parts uh, and do it regularly. Um, sometimes we recommend even cleaning daily. Uh, most of the times it has to be at least once a week uh, mm -hmm. to see your, your true results. and potential. Especially with masks. I think one of the things people don't realize is that the cushion where the mask actually mm -hmm. touches your face, you need to be either washing with soap and water and letting air dry every day or using you know, a CPAP wipe or something to make sure that you get rid of any oils and residue left where it's been touching your face. Yes. Because that will actually mess with your seal. Like, I think people don't realize like, oh, I'm getting, you know, some leaks from my mask that I never had before. Well, the first thing is, are you washing where it's touching your face every day? Because that's how you're going to maintain a really good seal. Yes, what Emma's talking about is this part right here. This is specifically yeah. the You can even see, I need to clean it really badly because I've got makeup <laughs> on it from the last time I wore it. Uh, don't, don't do that. You need to yeah. clean it. <laughs> uh, and, but this is your, your mask cushion. Um, this is actually the headgear, and this part doesn't uh, detach because it is that top of head. Um, but most of them are Velcro and will detach just like uh, what I have here. Yes. Um, but so you wanna make sure that you are cleaning this part on a regular basis. Use warm, soapy water and then air dry. And the air drying is very important because you should not use your mask again until it is completely dry. So make sure that you're doing this in the morning if you can. Yeah. I think the more you can just make it work with whatever your morning routine is, that's mm -hmm. the best thing. So like for me, I will wipe down my mask with a CPAP wipe before I even, you know, go to the bathroom to brush my teeth or any of that. Back to the replacements. Um, Aeroflow Sleep does have a replacement schedule that is recommended by um, the insurance companies. And yeah. you can uh, replace And that's covered by people's insurance, right? Because yes. usually it'll cover replacements at certain increments. So that's great. Yes. Yes, yeah, so most insurances will cover all of the various parts that are most important. Again, there are some things like the chin strap that it only deems a luxury, but your filter uh, needs to be replaced every two weeks. Uh, your mask frame needs to be replaced every uh, month. Uh, even the, the cushions, depending on what type of mask, would be replaced every two weeks or up to a month. That seems like super frequent, but I think that that's really important for people to know because I think that the oftentimes um, over time you're you can get little 
holes in in mm -hmm. things and you don't notice like you know you might not notice that that's happening in your hose for example and then when you get the new replacements come you realize that you're sleeping better and it's working better and that's why plus it'll make sure that you are staying healthy not even for your sleep apnea but yeah. just making sure that you don't have bacteria building up on right. your that can cause you to be ill uh, respiratory illness and sinus infections are actually very common among sleep apnea patients. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we, we probably can do a better job of just educating people of how frequently they need to be washing everything and why. I think that oftentimes people don't realize that it's preventing, like you're saying, like them getting some sort of respiratory illness or, you know, and I think it's, it's important because of that. Plus well, it's nicer. It just feels nicer. It smells yeah. better. And, and educating people, that's exactly why we're here today. Right. We are on this podcast and uh, we want to make sure that uh, everybody understands in the sleep apnea community that there are resources out there, but there are also support groups out there. Emma has her own podcast, uh, Sleep Apnea Stories. Go check it out if you haven't already. And she just published a workbook. I did. And I have it right here. Ah! So I was finding, it's called the Six Week CPAP Solutions Workbook. And I was just finding over three and a half years that I was having the same emails and Instagram DMs from people that were following and listening, asking the same questions again and again and again. And I just wanted to write something where people would have all of the information I never had when I started sleeping. CPAP right when I first started I just had so many small niggling problems that all together felt really insurmountable and I felt alone and isolated that I was the only person dealing with this so I think the workbook just allowed me to kind of address some of these issues like mass fit that we talked about I've I've put in here you know exactly how often people should be cleaning their equipment um all sorts of things it is definitely our favorite subject to talk about and it is something that you know we could continue to talk about all day um but unfortunately we are out of time and we have uh all of these great resources available to you guys uh always feel free to reach out to emma reach out to me emma is also our patient advocacy expert at Aeroflow sleep so she writes some blogs for us on her patient perspective uh, so there are a lot of ways to get connected with us uh, regarding sleep apnea. Uh, but thank you so much again. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm super excited for your podcast. I yeah. think you're like cut out to be a podcast host, Megan. So I'm glad. <laughs> well, that you're thank you. I really away. appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys again for joining us and uh, have a great rest of your day. We'll see you next time.